I started here with a picture of a bombardier beetle. Uh, if you're not familiar with bombardier beetle, uh, they have a kind of an interesting defense mechanism. If you scare a bombardier beetle, uh, they will shoot hot chemicals out of their butt. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Uh, how does that work? Uh, they have uh, two little pouches. One of them has hydroquinine in it. The other one has hydrogen peroxide. And what they do is when they combine, you create this exothermic reaction, which uh, creates a lot of heat, and it creates a popping sound. Now in this picture, looks like a scientist has kind of wired this up. Um, this is some biological glue, and so they're able to hit it with an electrode and fire it at will. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to start with this picture, too, and these two things. What I'm trying to show you is that even though this is chemistry, it applies directly to life. Um, and so this is an endorphin. Uh, endorphins are our body's natural opiate. And so if I go running and I feel that runner's high, it's because I, I have endorphins going through my body. Um, now, what's interesting about that is if I were to be addicted to opium, for example, a morphine-based drug, you can look at here, the chemistry of these is exactly the same. And they serve the same purpose. What they do is block neurotransmitters between neurons. Uh, and so it kind of dumbs that, uh, or numbs that feeling. Um, so I'm going to speed through these first couple. And so if, if none of this makes sense, maybe you weren't paying attention in physical science because this should really be review. Um, so when we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about the study of matter. Matter is essentially anything that has mass and takes up space. Um, we can break those down into two types. We've got elements and then compounds. Elements are going to be the things that are found on the periodic table, like hydrogen, uh, carbon is another example of one. Um, compounds are going to be hooking those together. So if we have a bunch of them in, in a specific uh, ratio, uh, water example, but DNA be an example of a compound as well. Um, I put a few things here that are, are nice to remember. Number one, I've got this schnapps written here. Schnapps is a good way to remember the important things or the chemical things in life that are important, and that is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And you should be able to say why they're important. Carbon building blocks, hydrogen also provide energy, but they're part of these building blocks. Nitrogen, really important in amino acids, which make up proteins, which make up us. Um, Oxygen is important in cellular respiration, but other reasons why. It's an electron acceptor. Phosphorus is going to be really important in holding together um, DNA. It's the, it it um, links together those. Uh, and also phosphorus is in our um, major energy uh, molecule called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And then sulfur is important in giving our protein structure. And so we need all of these things to live. Uh, next, I want to talk specifically about the atom. Atom, remember, has three subatomic particles. Those are the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Um, the proton and the neutron are way less important than the electron. Electron is what's hovering around the outside, and it's what gives an atom its properties. Um, some of those terms that you should have picked up from last year, remember the atomic number is going to be the number of protons and electrons that you have in an atom. Um, mass number is going to tell you the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, and then the the um, number of electrons will always be equal to the number of protons. So what does that mean? Let's break it down a little bit. If this is hydrogen on the periodic table, one means that it has one proton and one electron. H is simply its symbol, but it has a mass number of right around one. What does that mean? Well, a hydrogen atom has one proton, and since one minus one is zero, it has zero neutrons. Um, and, and we'll talk about protons uh, excuse me, uh, hydrogen a little bit later. As far as electrons go, one of the most famous ones that we have is, uh, as far as atoms go in, in life, in the life chemistry life, or organic chemistry is carbon. Uh, carbon on the periodic table is going to be number six. That means it has six protons and six electrons. Now the electrons are placed kind of in an odd way, uh, and they're placed in this fashion. You can put two electrons in the first energy level, um, you can put eight in the next, and you can put eight in the next. And so if we look at carbon, it's got two in the first, it's then got four in the next. Now it could have a possibility of eight in that level, and so since there are only four, it can form four bonds with other atoms. And that's why life is based on carbon. It's like the uh, ultimate Lego building block. You can build pretty much anything out of it. And once we fill out that outer shell, then that atom becomes stable. And so why does water look the way it does? It's because each of those hydrogen atoms can share one electron, and so now they have two in that first shell. They're happy. And oxygen needs to fill two more, and it can share those with hydrogen. Now the oxygen's happy, and so we have a stable water molecule. And, and I'll make water molecules like this for the rest of the year. Okay, so periodic table is organized this way. It's organized in 
from ascending order from the atomic number, and so that's the number of protons. But what's most important is the electrons. And so electrons, if you look vertically in the periodic table, um, they're all going to have the same number of valence or outer shell electrons. And so you find these really cool things in the periodic table, like look here, copper, silver, gold, all found on top of each other in the periodic table. Why? Because they have the same number of valence electrons. Or if we look over here, here's carbon, and silicon is right below it on the periodic table. And a lot of scientists think uh, that if we were to ever discover life, it would probably be built on carbon, this ultimate Lego building block, or silicon. And it's interesting, the two closest things, uh, excuse me, the closest thing to life we have on our planet, which uh, would be like... Um, artificial intelligence maybe that are uh, that are made on um, computers which are made of silicon okay let's keep going uh, bonds are important as far as chemistry go there are four important bonds that you need to understand the first is covalent then ionic then hydrogen and then finally van der Waals interactions covalent bonds occur when electrons are shared between two atoms and so for example in water hydrogen and oxygen are sharing their electrons in between the two and so that's covalent now, if they share those equally, then we call that a nonpolar bond. So, for example, in fat, here's uh, the hydrocarbon tails of fat. Neither the carbon or the hydrogen is pulling it more closely, and so we call that a nonpolar covalent bond. Um, polar example would be water. Since the oxygen really wants the electrons and hydrogen is kind of ambivalent, um, we get a negative portion down here and a positive portion up here, which we'll talk about in water. It's really important. In an ionic bond, you're actually transferring that electron. So what held, holds salt together? Well, you've got sodium and chlorine, and what you're doing is you're transferring an electron. Now chlorine has a negative charge. We call that an anion. Sodium has a positive charge, and they're held together with almost a a static charge. Really strong, but if you add water to it, we can break those very easily. That's why salt dissolves so readily in water. Uh, there are two types of bonds. One is hydrogen bond and then van der Waals. Hydrogen bonds I could do with my hands again. Since water has a negative charge right here and hydrogen has a positive charge right here, well, that hydrogen is attached to that oxygen and so they're held together. In other words, when I pull this one in this direction, this one comes with it. And that's what gives water its cohesive properties. Van der Waals forces are way weaker, but they're not any less important. Um, essentially what they are areas where there are lots of or not so many electrons and what they do is help to give proteins their three-dimensional shape and with proteins remember your shape is huge because it helps to operate what you do water is the next little bit and I've just got a couple of minutes left why is the water strider able to sit on top of it? Again, it's that cohesive force. And so to some terms you should understand about water. It's polar, and so you have this partial negative charge up here and positive charge down here. What are some properties of that? Cohesion. In other words, water is attracted to water. And as a result of that, when water goes up a tree, another water molecule will be pulled up. And we call that capillary action. Now, there's also adhesion. In other words, water will be attracted. Here, I've got a glass of water. And the water that's attracted to the side of the glass is actually uh, adhering to the side. And that's because it has a partial charge on the side. Um, next, an important trait of water is specific heat. Uh, specific heat is a measure of how much energy it takes to change um, a substance, one degree Celsius. The moral of the story is that water has a really high specific heat, so it takes a lot of energy. Let's look right here. It takes one cal per gram per degree centigrade, whereas opposed to in gold, it's only 0 0.03. How does that equate itself to our climate? Seattle and Bozeman are at about the same latitude, and so... Um, and the reason why is that Seattle is essentially in the ocean or it's close enough. Another key thing with water is that it's able to break down material. And in fact, that's why water is important to us um, because it creates this uh, solvent inside of us and it, and it can break down nutrients. The way it works, and this is a great picture right here, is that note here where you have the sodium ion, that the backside are all of the negative charges of the hydrogen will surround that. Whereas where we have this chlorine, um, we're going to have the, the, the hydrogen atoms or the hydrogen sides attaching to that. Last thing that I'll probably run out of time with is pH. pH essentially occurs when you have water molecule attracted to another one, and it's so great, that attraction between the two, that one pops off. And so it would be like if this hydrogen attached over the oxygen, we call that disassociation. It's really, really rare. And if that happens one in every 10,000 times, then we have a, a pH.